Jesus. All of God's people here this morning in agreement say, Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, we're going to be reading out of Psalm 32. And just to offer a little bit of context before we get into the word here this morning, I just want to kind of paint a little bit of a picture for you as to what's actually going on. Because sometimes when you're reading into the, the Psalms, you don't really know who's talking, where are they talking, what's going on. And so there's a really good image here for us to see, so it helps us understand the context of this text. Here we have a psalmist who is at a worship service in the temple, similar to this. And he, he comes up front and begins to offer up this prayer of repentance, sort, sort of. And the people all there are witnessing him communicating with God. And there's this kind of dialogue broken up in the text where he is praying. And then God kind of prays, speaks back to him. And, and everybody is witnessing it. So keep that image in mind as we read the text here this morning. And with God's word open before us, may we take a quick moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that gives life. May it do that here this morning for each and every one of us. Lord God, I pray for open ears and open eyes to hear and to see the things that you have prepared for us all here this morning, Lord God. May your spirit illuminate the eye of our mind to, to truly drink from your cup here this morning, Lord. And if there would be anything in me that would prevent your voice and your word from being heard, I pray that you would Remove it from my mind and my lips in this very, very moment. God, we thank you for your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Psalm 32. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise they will not come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Thus the reading of God's word here this morning. Noel Coward, a famous English playwright, once pulled an interesting prank. He sends an identical note to 20 of the most famous men in London. The anonymous note read simply, everyone has found out what you are doing. If I were you, I would get out of town now. <laughs> Supposedly, all 20 men actually left town immediately. <laughs> and so it is today. Simply put, in many different ways, people dance with evil and give in to selfish desires. Things that are better kept in the hidden in the closet or swept under the rug, or so we think. How often are then attempts made to keep the truth of sin silenced, hidden from others and from God? And when done, these secret hidden sins, they cultivate guilt and shame which lead to discouragement and defeat, even depression and anxiety, all of which can often be considered forms of suffering in one way or another. The psalmist in our text here today knows this. He knows it well because he lived it well. He's not all that different from you, from me, or those 20 famous men in London. He has sin in his life, and he too makes the mistake of trying to keep it hidden from others, 
and from God. As people gathered to worship in the temple, you could tell something in the air was just a little bit different on this day. Whether sitting in the front row with a picture-perfect view or standing in the very back squinting just trying to see the pulpit. Those worshiping witness a particular individual drop to his knees, humbling himself in a powerful way. While kneeling, this individual begins offering up a prayerful song of repentance to the Lord in front of everyone. A public display expressing sorrow and regret for having done something terribly wrong. When I kept silent about my sin, he proclaims to God with conviction in his throat and tears forming in his eyes, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. The psalmist's hidden sin had produced this stress that made him feel old and oppressed and dry as if his life was nearing its expiry date like a dried up raisin that was once a grape lost behind a kitchen stove. What kind of hidden sin could cause such pain and anguish in a person? Although unnamed, the psalmist in this text is better known as the one we refer to as a man after God's own hearts. Yes, David, the simple shepherd boy turned warrior king of Israel. David is so often portrayed in the light of a righteous hero, which he often is, but he is also human, and therefore he is no stranger to sin. In contrast to his commonly held righteous persona, here he falls hard into a season of sin that creates enough shame and guilt that he rationally thinks the best thing to do is to hide it from everyone, including God. Now if you're familiar with the Psalms, you, you might find that this one kind of hits a little bit different than most because the overall tone is not one of, of pain and sorrow, which is the typical flavor of a penitential psalm written during the suffering, before the repentance. You see, David pens this one in the aftermath of God's forgiveness, with his suffering now far behind him. But what exactly did God forgive David of? Well, the psalm itself does not identify the specific occasion which prompted its authorship, but... There is a general consensus among theologians and those types of people that suggest Psalm 32 is connected to Psalm 51. And Psalm 51 has strong evidence to suggest it was written shortly after David's sin with Bathsheba. His sin against Uriah. In which David promises in verse 13 of Psalm 51 to teach transgressors God's ways. Perhaps you recall that clear starry night when David should have been off at war with his fellow soldiers fighting for the nation of Israel. But instead, as he drinks in the cool, crisp evening air, his eyes catch a glimpse of a beautiful woman innocently bathing alone on her rooftop. David, acting out of selfish desires, does the unthinkable. The last thing any man should ever do, taking advantage of this woman, and consequently Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, who, I might mention, was one of King David's mighty men, suddenly finds herself pregnant with David's child. David knows he has made a costly mistake, consciously sinning against God and others, and he knows that there will be harsh consequences to pay for this selfish decision. But instead of confessing like the righteous man he's known to be, his immediate knee-jerk reaction is to hide everything, to keep it hidden. Now how foolish is David to think that he could hide anything at all from God? And as the dust settles in sort of the initial drama of the David and Bathsheba story, the final verse in 2 Samuel 11 sums up the scene quite accurately. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Now it is also suggested by many theologians and scholars that Psalm 32 isn't just simply connected to Psalm 51, but it is actually the fulfillment of that Psalm 51 vow. We often read the Psalms in chronological order in terms of 1 to 150, but sometimes that's not always how they play out. See Psalm 51 verse 13, to teach transgressors God's ways, 
is essentially what Psalm 32 is stating. However, the specific details of that don't really matter as much as the general recognition here this morning that unconfessed sin is still sin no matter how you slice it or dice it and try to hide it. And as David continues his public testimony in front of all those worshiping, crying out, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. He hints to his experiencing a measure of pain and, and anguish and suffering that is a direct result of his own inaction. His lack of essentially coming clean to God with his sin. And although the sin he committed and the suffering he endured, again, is not clearly identified, the hand that was heavy upon him throughout his groanings all day long, it was not necessarily in the form of physical suffering, which I think we often jump to that conclusion whenever we think of pain and suffering, we think of the physical aspect of it. But much more likely what's taking place here is a, a spiritual suffering, like a mental state of mind, a measure of guilt and shame that cripples David, the kind of shame and guilt that even caused him to avoid God altogether for a season of his life. And because he was unwilling to kneel at the personal confessional booth of his own heart with God, those unconfessed sins, they, they boiled over and became such a heavy burden that they produced suffering only he could blame for himself. But you got to figure, being a, a mere man, at some point, surely David wanted relief because he had to have been sick and tired of being sick and tired from the silence of his sin. Many of us are just like David. On the outside, we carry a righteous persona, but on the inside, we carry around the weights of burdens that we can often only blame for ourselves. And similar to David, we make mistakes, mistakes that are selfish and sinful, and mistakes that we don't want anybody to ever know about, including God, and so we try and hide them. We try and tuck them deep down into the darkest parts of our souls and hope that nobody, not even God himself, discovers them. And as a result of this silence, this unconfessed sin, our very own guilt and shame can often boil over with the potential to cripple us too, causing us measures of spiritual or mental suffering and seasons where even we try to avoid God altogether. And so as you consider the mistakes David made, in his decision to remain silent with God. Are you reminded of maybe a situation in your own life where maybe you've carefully brushed a sin underneath your favorite rug or buried it in the back of your closet and now, maybe now you're beginning to regret it as forms of suffering begin to set in and eat away at your conscience. It's possible some can even relate specifically to David's selfish choices. Or perhaps you've gotten into the habit of deleting your web browser history, thinking that if nobody can see what you're doing on the internet, well then no harm done, right? Or maybe you began hiding your growing inventory of empty beer bottles or wine bottles in the darkest parts of your closet so that nobody can see how much you've been drinking in this past season. Whatever the poison is, it's a harsh reality that all of us sin in some way, shape, or form. We all fall short of the glory of God, and we so often just want to crawl up in a ball and hide our sins from others and from God. This, my friends, is the truth that we simply cannot hide from. And forgive me for my, my bluntness, but you know, if I was to say it the way I really just want to say it, I'd simply say, don't bother trying to fool yourself either. I mean, our God is omniscient, meaning he knows everything about everyone all the time. That includes you and me and the, all the silent, secret, hidden sins of our past, of our present, and our future. I mean, the sins we haven't even thought up of yet. He knows. He knows them all. And perhaps you're beginning to experience some form of burden in your mind due to the weight of hiding something from God a weight that you've been carrying around, a, a burden that's just far too heavy for you to carry. And much like David, you too are just sick and tired of being sick and tired from the burdens of that hidden sin.
Now, I once found myself in a situation many moons ago when I worked as an electrician before I was involved in ministry. I'll never forget, it was a very cold, dark morning as we were working on an exterior building that hadn't quite had the walls put in yet. It was cold, and so we were gathered around in a small circle, drinking hot coffee, trying to stay warm as we planned out our work day. As we began pulling out all of our tools and such, I accidentally knocked over my coffee directly into my friend's tool pouch. And not just any tool pouch, but his tool pouch that held his brand new hammer drill. Now, as you can imagine, I panicked quickly, and I grabbed that cup, and I turned around and made sure that nobody saw what had happened, and I, I was in the clear. Shortly thereafter, I heard very choice words coming from my friend's mouth, wondering out loud why the bleep his tool pouch was all of a sudden soaking wet with bleeping hot coffee. Well, I, I turned around and took a now fake sip of my hot coffee and looked him right in the eyes and said, geez, I don't know, man, I'm, I'm so sorry, that really sucks. For days that turned into weeks, and then months, I lived with this excruciating guilt of what I had done, as I had lied and hid the truth of this accident from everyone, including him. And the longer I kept the secret, the worse the burden became, as the, the guilt and the shame grew stronger in my conscience. It eventually got so bad that I even made the conscious effort to avoid seeing him or talking to him on job sites. I mean, it was literally eating me from the inside out. And you see, it's worth taking notice here for clarity's sake that it wasn't a sin that I spilt the coffee. Accidents happen. Rather, it was hiding the truth from my friend that offers us a parallel to the way in which we as Christians often attempt hiding our darkest sins from God and from others and how that shame and guilt can often burden us to the point of suffering. But let me remind you, faithful sons and daughters, there's no lack of good news for those of us today who have hidden sin in our lives. And this was news that was also good for King David back in his day too. You see, as David testifies to the burden of his hidden sin, he has this oddly joyful tone about him that may maybe you picked it up in the text. I mean, why wouldn't he? Remember, this is not a, a sorrowful psalm. It's kind of a one-off. It's a, a rather a rejoiceful psalm sung post-suffering. Through his confessional testimony, David rejoices for what great things God has done for him. He recognizes just how fortunate he truly is. Hear David proclaim, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. David acknowledges that God is the one who not only forgives sin, but also provides the blessings of relief in times of suffering. And as he continues his public display, you can almost hear the smile on his face as he testifies to confessing, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. And you, God, forgave the guilt of my sin. Now it would be nice to assume that of his own accord, David simply came to the revelation that, you know, the only way out of this mess that he was in was to, to dig up his sin, to enter the confessional booth of his heart, and to fess up. But unfortunately, it's not exactly how it played out. David needed a little help. He needed a little nudge. And so God, in all his wisdom, sent the prophet Nathan to confront David, using a parable, essentially, to sort of trick him into this revelation that it was time to fess up. And as he testifies to this truth in front of all those worshiping with him in the temple, David fulfills his Psalm 51 promise to teach other sinners God's way, to confess and to repent of sins. And not only will God forgive you, but he will also deliver you from your suffering too. That pain and anguish produced by the guilt and shame of hidden sin will be washed away. You are my hiding place, David boldly declares. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. David confesses. God moves and sin is forgiven. And not only does God bring relief to David's suffering, but his confession helps restore their personal relationship as David draws closer to God once again. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, he reminds the worshippers present with him. But he who trusts in the Lord, 
Loving kindness shall surround him. David knew what it was like to be a guilty sinner. He knew the seriousness of his sin. But he also knew how much better it is to confess and to truly be forgiven. And in the same way that David starts this psalm praising God for what a blessing it is to be forgiven of sin, he wraps up his testimonial confession with another dose of joyous, praiseful encouragement to be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. And may these words of David be heard like a, a prophet Nathan nudge for all of us holding on to hidden sin today, remembering that God desires we do with our sin what David eventually did. And that's reveal it to him. And not just some of it, not most of it, but all of it. And now you might be thinking, you know, we are a little bit unlike David because we do stand on the other side of the cross today post-life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So how does that make a difference? Well, in many respects, it doesn't. The same way still applies. Even though Jesus paid the ultimate price for the forgiveness of our sins, we still have the responsibility of consistently confessing and repenting in order to keep our conscience clean and free of that shame and guilt that comes with the burdens of hidden sin. God's ear is always open and attentive to our voices. And the Holy Spirit who dwells within us is always ready to, to lead us and to guide us to that place. And God's ear, well, God's ear was available to David all throughout his entire, entire journey too. Right? From sin to forgiveness. Every second of every day, God was waiting patiently to hear that voice speak those beautiful words. Lord God, I confess my sin to you. This is God's way for David and the people of Israel that were worshiping with him then. And it is still God's way for us today. Is something that even Jesus himself taught his disciples. And it's likely that you know the prayer, right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Dot, dot, dot. Forgive us our debts. And even though Jesus clearly taught us how to pray and confess our sins, and it's likely a lot of us have that, that prayer memorized even, it doesn't mean we are always so quick to go to the throne room, to go to the confessional booth of our hearts with God to confess. I mean, despite the, the wisdom, the amount of wisdom dripping from the pages of the Bible, I mean, I think of one of my favorites is Proverbs 28, verse 13, which in a way sums up Psalm 32. I mean, I could have just preached that and this would have been a much shorter sermon. But it teaches that he who conceals transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. And that's just one of many, many. And even then, sometimes... For some reason, we, we pull away and we avoid God in order to hide our sins from him, thinking that for some reason it's our best, most rational decision, when in reality, all God wants is our honest, raw confession and repentance in the name of his son, Jesus. And with those simple words that David spoke and Jesus taught, Lord God, I confess, and forgive us our debts, we are forgiven. One simple conversation with God Almighty in the confessional booth of our hearts and all the weight of our sin can be lifted and all the burdens of our suffering washed away. Through the power and prompting of the Holy Spirit, we confess God moves and sin is forgiven. It's as easy as one, two, three. Amen? Now, when I hid the truth from my friend at work many, many moons ago, I, I mean, it ate me alive to the point where I decided I had no other choice but to fess up, to confess what happened and hope that he would forgive me. So I approached him one day and I said, hey, dude, I, I got to tell you something. Remember that time that someone spilled coffee all over your brand new drill? He's like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Well, it was me. And I'm so sorry. I understand if you can't forgive me, if you won't, whatever, and... To my surprise, well, he did forgive me. Right there on the spot, without a, without a second breath, he forgave me. And immediately I experienced this relief 
from the burdens that were causing like legitimate suffering in my mind and in my heart. It felt as if a giant weight had been lifted off my conscience and suddenly I felt blessed without even really knowing what it meant to be blessed. I wasn't even a Christian yet at that point. But it became a beautiful day to be alive in my eyes because that shame and that guilt had been washed away. There's something so powerful about confessing our sins to God. And I think how much greater is the blessing today when people confess their sins to God and are given new life in Christ through God's forgiveness. There's no greater event in a person's life. The Apostle John, who wrote one of the Gospel accounts, he, he hits the bullseye when he writes in one of his first, his first of three letters to believers nearing the end of the first century. In 1 John 1 verse 9, he says this, If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's beautiful. God is the faithful promise keeper and through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, we are able to bring our darkest, most humiliating and shameful secrets to him, knowing that without a doubt we will be forgiven because Jesus has already paid the price for our sins. This, my friends, is the beauty of God's grace-filled, redemptive plan for each and every one of us. Therefore, church, Covenant Hope, I encourage you today with a Holy Spirit-prompted, prophet Nathan-like nudge to not waste any more of your precious time cultivating unnecessary suffering in your own life through the burdens of guilt and shame that come with hiding sins from God or from anyone. It's just not worth it. Life is way too short. So may we confess our sins like David, acknowledging our sins to you, Lord God, and our iniquities we will no longer hide. We confess our transgressions to you, Lord Almighty. And as we confess, hear God respond in great delight with these affirming words. You, my faithful children, my precious sons and daughters, you are forgiven. What a blessing it is indeed to confess, to repent, and to be forgiven. As the psalmist says, shout for joy, all of you who are upright in heart. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word here this morning, your word that has the power to save lives. Lord, we thank you how clearly you teach us to not hide our sins from you, that you desire to, to hear each and every dark thing that we do that does not honor you, but yet you offer your forgiveness. You cleanse us of all unrighteousness when we come to you open-hearted. So Lord, I pray that your spirit would move here today and do exactly that, would, would lead us to a place of confession, of repentance, where we can truly receive that forgiveness, knowing without a doubt that your ears are open to hear us and that your voice is available to remind us that we are forgiven and that we are loved. We thank you for that here this morning, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.